Right. We're going to get started here and welcome everybody to the Ward 7 Forum with the League of Women Voters of Corvallis and the NAACP Corvallis Albany Chapter. My name is Jessica McDonald. I am the president of the League of Women Voters. And what is the League of Women Voters, right? For 100 years, we have been working towards a more perfect democracy. We are proud to be a nonpartisan education and advocacy organization. And the League works on issues that impact you, that impact me and our families, voting rights, climate change, housing policy, social justice. The League is a place where you can have an impact on the issues that you care about. Uh, I hope if you are not involved with the League that we could talk after today and maybe there's um, an area that you'd like to, to grow and learn in you know, within the League and I'd love to talk to you more about that. As we prepare to submit our ballots to the boxes this year, also I just want to put a plug in for the role that the League plays in educating on the issues and the candidates that you are voting on, especially putting in a shout out to vote411.org, which is a one-stop shop for all things voting related. Now I have the good fortune to introduce our co-host and a wonderful representative from the Corvallis Albany branch of the NAACP, President Angel Harris. Angel, welcome. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, it's so good to be here with you. Um, thank you so much um, for partnering with us uh, in this endeavor. I, my name is Angel Harris, and I am the president of our Corvallis Albany branch, um, which also extends, it seems like, to our Philomas and our Lebanon members as well. So I want to give a shout out to you as well. Um, and we are the oldest, um, and some would say the boldest, um, uh, social justice organization, civil rights organization um, in our country. Uh, we were founded in 1909 um, and our branch was founded in 1971. Um, so we're getting ready to celebrate here in January. Um, but we, we fight for equity. Um, we fight for uh, black lives, right? And so um, we get, we are involved, we're involved in our school districts, we're involved in our city councils, we're involved uh, wherever we can make a difference, um, whether it's local, whether it's state or national. Um, so sending um, just greetings from NAACP and wanna encourage all of us to vote. Um, it is our right, uh, it is our privilege to vote. And so if you don't do nothing else, make sure you vote this year, okay? <laughs> Um, and I would like to introduce you to our moderator for this evening, uh, Jason J. Dorsett, who is the NAACP Vice President, um, as well as just a mentor to so many um, in our city and also in the OSU community. So, um, Jason J. Dorsett. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you. Uh, Angel for that for that warm introduction. Welcome to the Corvallis City Council Ward 7 Forum. Candidates and the other eight wards are running unopposed. We are in a Zoom webinar and your video and audio will not be turned on. The forum is also being recorded. Each candidate will have three minutes for an opening statement and then two minutes for two other questions which were supplied to the candidates in advance. Questions covering a wide variety of topics, such as climate change, racism, COVID-19, land use and emergency services were collected from the, from the community in advance and some will be asked tonight. Thanks to all who took the time to send questions. If there is time, if there is time you can enter questions in the Q&A box and send these and some of these questions could possibly be asked if they are on topic and if they have not already been covered. Candidates will have a minute and a half to answer each of the questions. All of these questions will be sent to each candidate after the form. Candidates, we're now going to allow you uh, three minutes uh, to provide an opening statement 
and we will start with uh, candidate Bowman, Nick Bowman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dorsett, and to the others who have um, put this evening on for us tonight. Um, I think that that really harkens to the reason why I'm running, as this is my opening statement for such. Late July, I was sitting on the couch reading an article uh, in the newspaper by a local political writer uh, with my wife. Uh, the political writer had written about a state of election shortage for candidates. I have very limited political background and community service and engagement is something that I am passionate about, but have not prioritized much in my life. But this article struck me as a call to action. Not having an opposed race is not inherently a bad thing. Um, but I firmly believe that presenting voters with the choice, presenting them with information and options, provides them with the opportunity to be more engaged, to hold themselves and their elected officials more accountable. In all honesty, I have no qualms or um, negative or harsh um, opposing feelings towards my um, co-candidate uh, here, Mr. Schaefer. Um, but I would like to, as I said, simply provide the voters with the choice. As this evening carries on and I'm able to answer questions about specific topics, I hope that I provide some relevant insight, possibly new ideas, and a direction that provides vision for a future with me as a city councilor for Corvallis. With that said, I thank you for having me here again, and I look forward to the rest of the evening. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Our next candidate, current city councilor, Mr. Paul Schaefer. Okay, thank you, Jason. Um, thank you those who are watching for taking time to learn and, and for your interest in Corvallis government. And thank you especially to the league for organizing this forum and others, and likewise the NAACP to help educate voters and improve government. I think it's a wonderful thing and an important thing. So who am I? Who's Paul Schaefer? Well, I'm a long-term resident of Corvallis. Um, I grew up on the East Coast, went to school at Michigan State, University of Virginia, moved here in 1984 to take a job. I've been here ever since and I have no intention of leaving. Um, my kids grew up here. They made their friends, they played sports, they went to Corvallis Public Schools. They both went to and graduated from Oregon State. My wife was a longtime school district employee before she retired from Corvallis High School a couple of years ago. I'm a scientist by training. I have a bachelor's and master's degrees in environmental sciences um, and, and did most of a PhD at University of Virginia before a job and, and family got in the way of finishing it. Um, I came to Corvallis to work as a contractor at the US EPA lab. My last 12 years before I retired, I was with the state of Oregon uh, at the Oregon Department of Energy as a technical and policy analyst working on cleanup and restoration of the Hanford site in Washington. Um, why am I running? Well, several reasons. First, I care deeply about Corvallis. It's a great place to live and raise a family, and it's important to keep it that way. Um, and as I said a year ago when I first ran, um, I spent my working career letting somebody else do the heavy lifting with local government and schools and so on. Now I have time and I feel a responsibility to give some of that back. Um, I offer a skill set that's well suited to city council, a blend of knowledge, experience, judgment, um, working with challenging technical issues working on contentious issues with diverse, sometimes contentious groups of people. Um, I've developed and managed budgets and I have strong communication skills. Thank I'm you, Mr. Schaefer. What? Thank you, thank you so much. That is your wow. time. That three yes. minutes went quicker. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we're going to transition now uh, to uh, the questions that the candidates both received um, in advance. And so we're going to start with Mr. Bowman uh, and allow Mr. Bowman to respond to this question and then we'll um, uh, allow uh, Mr. Schaefer to also respond. So the question, 
what are your goals for the upcoming term? When I first entered this race, it wasn't about a list of goals that I had because, as I said, I didn't enter with the incentive to change things. Um, but in this process, I have developed some goals that I would like to share with you. Besides relentlessly being a studious in learning all of the jargon and acronyms used as a city government official, um, I would like to focus on several different areas outlined in the strategic operating plan. Um, community nonprofits um, engagement needs to be a high priority. Um, I would like to increase um, opportunities for the recruitment and attraction of nonprofit groups and to increase the community outreach. I think that this addresses several issues um, that Corvallis faces um, as far as homelessness and public services, um, or at least begins to support those uh, services already in place. Uh, I also believe that it is important to be very proactive in our relationship with OSU um, as another point of engagement. I think that OSU has many great responsibilities and offerings um, and dealings with this city, and that relationship needs to be uh, bolstered and continue to be fitted for additional opportunities to increase community support. Uh, I'd also like to really prioritize a net zero carbon uh, imprint and footprint for the city. I think that that comes down to focusing on building codes. Uh, these building codes are meant to incentivize the correct and responsible building, I correct me, not the right response there, uh, the responsible building of uh, environmentally friendly buildings. Um, and we can get back to looking at increasing our CET, uh, the construction excise tax that has been severely hit uh, by this COVID-19 and decrease in local construction. I assume that I'm very close to two minutes, so I'll end there. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Yes, you were right with two seconds left. All right, Mr. Schaefer, same question. Tell us. Okay. Yeah, I, in the broadest sense, I think my goals and really the city's goals are to continue with the work laid out in our blueprints, the 2040 vision and the strategic operating plan. Um, I think one of the things in looking at any goals is to recognize COVID is going to have significant impacts on our budgets and our services for the next several years. And so we're going to have to adjust priorities and budgets uh, to live or programs to live within those budgets. We need to start moving the city back to a new normal um, with access to meetings, restarting advisory boards and so on. Programmatically, there's, there's four issues that I think I would put at the top of the list that, that need continuing attention. And unfortunately, I don't really have time to speak to them now. I hope there will be questions that go to them. Housing. Um, housing remains very tight, very expensive in Corvallis. Um, homelessness. During the COVID epidemic, the city has stopped posting homeless camps. Um, but that doesn't solve our problems in any way. We need to continue to make progress on, on climate change and reducing the cities and the private sectors um, carbon footprint. And we need to address hate bias issues in the city. Um, Corvallis has allocated money for that. I think city manager Shepard's been talking to you, Jason, and to Jonathan Stahl at OSU. Um, and we're trying to, to lead local area governments in developing those programs and training. Um, there are a lot of other secondary issues with advisory boards, cleaning up the city charter, cleaning up city codes, and I won't get into those now. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer, for that response. All right, moving on to our second question that were uh, share with our candidates uh, a little bit in advance. And we'll start with Mr. Schaefer. What are your budget priorities? First priority for the budget, I think, has to be to preserve as much as possible ongoing programs and services uh, while we're living in a time of reduced budgets. Based on data to date, we know the city's expecting a hit of about $5 million a year from logic and taxes, fines and forfeitures, um, registrations for parks and rec, um, some loss from state money. And I think we have a, an unknown at this point 
um, hit coming from people who are unable to pay their city services bills. Um, we, we simply don't know what that's going to look like, but it could be a fairly heavy hit on the budget. Some things not to do in terms of the budget. Um, we should not be tapping into reserves. City spent a lot of time building those up. Um, and, and we're not at the point where we need to think about that. We do not need to be raising taxes or fees. We've been through a cycle of that the last couple of years. We don't need to game the system and, and beg, borrow, steal, things like system development charge. And we don't need to buy a bridge. Um, for the 22, I think new programs are going to be minimal. We're going to be as I say, trying to preserve what we can and manage cuts with, with a reduced budget to the extent there is additional money going into programs. I'd like to see it going into services for the homeless um, and affordable housing. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. You're very welcome. Same question, uh, Mr. Bowman. Um, I agree with many of the points that Mr. Schaefer has made. I think that the budget will be significantly impacted and well beyond projections uh, for its negative impacts from COVID. COVID. Um, and with that said, there are some outline policies already um, from the city council that I would like to quote that I think are worth mentioning and carrying forward with. Um, Striking a balance between the community's desire for service asking f and asking for money from community members. Um, we have, as Ms. Schaefer has said, gone through levies and raised taxes for various capital funding, and we want to continue to provide services at the highest level. But there is just no money for certain things, and being able to decide what gets funded at the highest levels and what gets cut or minimized um, is tough conversations ahead. I do know that in many of the operating um, documents that I saw that administrative costs are a large portion of many of the expenditures in the funding areas and whatever can be done to efficient, uh, make that more efficient and eliminate redundancies would be something I would look into. Um, I also think that it's very uh, important to look at the community development revolving fund um, because there is a lot of, uh, I feel, opportunity to bolster that uh, fund there because of the wonderful things that it does. Um, and that should be a high priority, making sure that um, as we have discussed low income housing options um, and other issues that address homelessness in the, uh, in the city. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Bowen. Now we're going to transition to the um, portion of our program in which each candidate will have 90 seconds, a minute and a half, to uh, answer a question. And then the other candidate will have an opportunity, another minute and a half, to also respond or, or to give a, re a rebut. So uh, we will start with uh, Mr. Bowman. First question, as I get my timer started here. All right, first question. Explain with specific examples how you are committed to anti-racism work. Please bring instances about that from your lived experiences, work, and public service. I'll repeat the question. Explain, with, explain with specific examples how are you committed to anti-racism work? Please bring instances about, the, about that from your lived experiences work and public service. Mr. Bowman. Um, systemic and overt racism um, is problematic and it is not something to turn a blind eye to or to make excuses for, um, but examples and where I stand on this, I have spent many years working as a public educator. I've worked with many underserved communities and quite often the population represented in those communities are black, brown families. There are immigrant families. They are families who are quite often under the thumb of systemic racism. 
I have had the opportunity in very limited regard to address it specifically with my classes that I teach. I'm an elementary school teacher and we talk about equality versus equity all the time. Having said that, I don't think that it stops right there. I think that we need to continue to support educational programs that allow uh, the educating of our youth so that they do not kind of grow up as a generation perpetuating these same systemic beliefs. I don't have the exact examples and the lesson plans that I've pulled out. I'm sorry, I don't. My community engagement and political activism has been limited and I can honestly and wholeheartedly admit that. But I do pledge that my commitment to that my commitment to addressing these issues carries forward as a councilman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Mr. Schaefer. Okay. Um, I, I will also say that I grew up in a solidly white community and most of my lived experience has been in that place. Um, I've had extensive experience in my time with the state of Oregon dealing with Native American peoples. It is a different kind of racism, but no less enduring, no less systematic. Um, and I, I have developed a great appreciation and respect for the problems that, that they have and they face. In Corvallis, I guess I would cite two particular examples. Um, when the whole issue of defund the police and questions about the Corvallis police arose late last spring following the murder of George Floyd, um, I sat down with the police chief and had a, a long conversation about how they train, what they do, what they don't do, whether they think defunding the police is, for instance, was a, a viable and a good idea. Um, I came away with an appreciation. I was also part of a vote on the city to fund a um, hate bias position that the city had been talking about since before I was on council. Um, we recognize, we're already recognizing it wasn't working. So, okay. Thank you. Better Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Shepard. All right. Uh, question, uh, first question. I will start with you, Mr. Shepard. Um, Schaefer, excuse me. What action should the city council take? Excuse me. What action should the city council take minimize, to minimize the damage to both our health and economics due to COVID-19? Again, what actions should the city council take to minimize the damage to both our health and economy due to COVID-19? Mr. Schaefer. Okay, I, I would like to start by noting that it's, I think, actions that would be taken by the city and county and Oregon State not simply city council. Um, I, I think there are several things we have done, several things, additional things we could do. Um, city council acted quickly this spring to um, enable restaurants to set up extra outdoor seating. Um, that gives them more people that they can serve. I think that's been a um, important um, action for the city. The city has supported and funded the Corvallis Sewing Brigade, um, who has made and, and donated more than 50,000 masks in the community to help stop the spread of COVID. And I would just mention that my wife and I have, have worked with the Sewing Brigade throughout and donated to them. Um, the city, as a public health measure, stopped um, posting homeless camps this spring. Uh, recognizing that that population is exceedingly vulnerable to COVID. And we have also been working with Oregon State um, to try to develop ways to manage behaviors on and, and in the case of City Council, particularly off campus, um, and to work with them on testing programs to look at prevalence and, and follow up of COVID. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Mr. Bowman. 
I would agree that council policy um, goes only so far and that we do need to be paying attention very closely to the state at large and the county at large. But addressing and identifying and addressing specific policies that inhibit businesses to reopen, um, as Mr. Schaefer mentioned about outdoor seating, like taking over parking spaces like that, these are great ways that we can begin to implement a new sense of normalcy um, and allow businesses to participate. So relaxing and temporarily relieving businesses of certain um, obligations um, or uh, codes that would not in any way sort of impede traffic or um, prevent or cause other issues. Um, but to allow them to open in ways that does attract more business to them. Uh, as far as their health goes, I think that Mr. Schaefer spoke very um, correctly as he identified something I mentioned earlier as our partnership with OSU. Um, students in the influx of people who come to this great city on an annual basis um, bring with them great ex cultural experiences, um, a wealth of knowledge, um, and potentially um, with them germs from afar. Um, but that isn't something that we need to focus in on as a problem, but as an opportunity for us to address hygiene and other common practices and safe practices in general. Uh, we've all seen the signs driving down um, uh, Harrison where you have the, you know, party quietly, you know, essentially is what it says, you know, be respectful of your neighbors. But those are the same messages that we need to be putting out there for um, the safety of our you know, community as far as face masks and hand washing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Uh, our next question, Mr. Bowman, do you agree that climate change and ecosystem de degradation is real and constitutes a grave threat? If so, what do you propose that our city do to address and reverse the causes of climate change prices? I'll ask that question again. Do you agree that climate change and ecosystem degradation, de yes, degradation is real and constitutes a great threat? If so, what do you propose that our city do to address and reverse the causes of the climate crisis? Uh, I believe in my opening statements um, or somewhere along there that I did say that I do believe that a zero carbon emissions footprint is something that uh, Corvallis should strive for. I believe that climate change is a significant impact or significantly impacting our ecosystems as well as many other um, environmental uh, I'm not a soil um, expert and, and things like that. I, I, don't, I, I don't have those sort of skill sets. Um, I don't know the intricacies of the damage, but I do believe in it. And I do believe that our policies and leading by example, as I mentioned earlier, creating housing that is solar ready, parking structures that are ready for electric vehicles, incentivizing new construction that um, promotes that as well as public services that promote that. I do believe this is a problem. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Schaefer. Yeah, I, I will start with the obvious. Um, yes, climate change is real and I believe it is, a, is an existential threat to not only Corvallis, but to mankind. Um, what can the city do? We have to recognize that Corvallis is, is a small part of a global problem. We can do what we can do. We can set an example, um, but there's a lot of other people have to play their parts as well. The city is um, working to, to lower its carbon footprint. It will continue to do that in a variety of ways. Um, the city is working on or has thing places that are sequestering carbon, such as the Corvallis watershed um, on the east side of Mary's Peak. And as Mr. Bowman suggested, I think um, city building codes, uh, land development code could be updated, should be updated to encourage better energy efficiency, 
and to um, make solar and, and so on more available. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Okay. All right, Mr. Schaefer, you have our next question to start us off. Okay. Given, given that increasing drought, along with other factors, is increasing our fire danger, what measures would you propose to protect our city from fire damage? Again, given that increasing, given that in, in, increasing drought, along with other factors, is increasing our fire danger, what measures would you propose to protect our city from fire damage? Um, there's several things the city can and should be doing. Um, building codes can discourage um, continued use of flammable materials for roofing, for instance. Um, the city does engage with areas like the Ponderosa West neighborhood um, that's, that's in a vulnerable location at a wildland urban interface uh, to have homeowners do things on their properties to, to clear vegetation, create fire breaks, um, a variety of other things that will render their properties less vulnerable. Um, large firestorms such as we saw early last month um, are, are a challenge to all of us and to our thinking. Um, I think the city needs to, should look at protecting boundaries around the city, wildland urban interface again, by managing, better managing vegetation, um, by encouraging homeowners to use something such as firewise practices to um, improve the safety of their personal property. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Mr. Bowman? Um, I would agree and echo some of those same sentiments. I think that community education is one of the greatest things that we have at our disposal um, when it comes to making recognizable and progressive change. Uh, if we're worried about climate change and fire safety, then we need to put that out there. Um, I'm not an expert in these areas, but I am very good at getting through expert opinion and information um, to make sound decisions. I think that our rural and bordering boundaries, um, those urban and wild uh, interactions, uh, definitely pose our greatest um, opportunity uh, for this education. Um, I'm not particularly concerned about wildfire sleeping through downtown proper, um, but we are surrounded by beautiful acreage um, that is subject to these environmental shifts. Um, and if we're not a stewards of the land, uh, then we can't claim to be protectors um, of it and we cannot and should not reap the benefits of it. I think that we have a lot of people in this community who appreciate it and would be receptive to this type of education. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Our next question, and we'll start with Mr. Bowman, but our next question, what changes would you make to the funding, staffing, and training of our emergency services? Again, what changes would you make to the funding and staffing and training of our emergency services? Mr. Bowman. Um, I think that the very last part of that question is the part that would get most of my attention is the training. Um, I believe in trauma-informed training. Um, I think that this is something that all first responders, emergency workers, anybody who interfaces with the public um, would benefit from. Uh, trauma-informed training just simply recognizes that somebody comes to you with a history um, and that that history may be causing the current situation, whether it be a mental breakdown, whether it be um, a violent outburst, uh, whatever the situation is. Um, so I believe that trauma-informed training is something that should be prioritized by all public service uh, departments who interface regularly with the public, but especially those of first responders. Thank you. Mr. Schaefer? Yeah, I think 
Let me start by saying, first of all, that I think the training um, and staffing of our police and fire is first rate. Um, our police department is accredited. They have worked very hard. Former Chief John Sassman, who retired this year, um, on training and on de-escalation tactics. Um, I, I believe that our police force is, is well-trained, well, particularly well-trained to de-escalate and avoid violence um, and, and overreaction and escalation of situations. Our fire department is, is also well-trained. As far as staff, uh, both those departments were understaffed until recently and the police and fire levy um, a year ago has helped with staffing to bring numbers up to where um, department managers are comfortable with it. Actually getting those staff on board has been slowed because police academy was shut down because of COVID. Um, and, and I think in general, we have police and fire that we can be proud of. The place that I think we can use additional effort, and uh, Mr. Bowman made reference to it, is those instances of people in stress um, and having a, a policeman respond to that's not the best situation in all cases. I think something like the CAHOOTS program in Eugene would be helpful. Thank you so much, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, we're going to start with you with our next question. Okay. What, what, if any changes to the city charter, would you support? Again, what, if any changes to the city charter, would you support? I think there's probably two areas that have, have gotten a lot of attention on the city charter of uh, recently. And there, there was a look at that in fact, by a group from city council and, and community members in the past year. And that work got sidetracked, unfortunately, by COVID and, and other things. The places that I think have gotten the most attention is how many city councilors, how long is a term, um, and should that be changed? Right now, we elect all nine councilors every two years. Uh, that risks a big loss of, of institutional knowledge when that turns over. There is some sentiment for longer terms and for staggered terms um, to, to alleviate that situation, and I would support both those measures. Um, there's been some discussion of how counselors are elected, whether they continue to be wards or whether there are at-large elections. I believe strongly that election by ward is the best way to get good representation of, of everybody in the community. The last item is, is paying counselors because it's been argued that nothing but retired people has the time to, to do a good job of, of being a good counselor. Um, I think the makeup of the current council gives lie to that. We have a lot of young people with full-time jobs and families. Um, I said a year ago, I was not in favor of paying. I, I would soften that somewhat to provide some support for families. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Mr. Bowman? Um, in, in the last couple months in, in gathering information for this candidacy, um, I have pawed over the charter and honestly, the work that goes into annual review and the wording that has been laid before us is not without thought and consideration. I think that Mr. Schaefer has touched on some areas that have been brought up by some of the individuals who I've spoken with as far as terms for uh, city council and, and mayor, and that there is a huge risk of institutional knowledge being lost, um, and that I too would support um, a staggered or a longer term. Um, and as far as pay goes, I think that, that is something that is also extremely relevant. The, the current system does prevent a lot of otherwise would-be uh, candidates who could put themselves out there if it were not for the 30 plus hours of additional volunteer work that you're basically doing, um, if not more, uh, for such uh, position. I cannot imagine um, 
although I hope to, uh, the amount of additional hours that each of the city council puts into uh, their jobs, especially those who care so passionately about this city. Um, I have had a tremendous amount of individuals contact me um, expressing concerns about me running or about the city. And that isn't even with me as a, can as a councilman yet. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Our next question, and we'll start with you. The Corvallis vision statements call for Corvallis to be a vibrant and diverse community. Given the cost of housing in our community, what steps would you initiate to ensure that the vision is actualized? Again, the Corvallis vision statements call for, calls for Corvallis to be a vibrant and diverse community. Given the cost of housing in our community, what step would you initiate to ensure that, that the vision is actualized? Um, I, I think that housing costs is definitely um, at a premium in Corvallis. Uh, and you would hope that that premium would come with all the wonderful services that Corvallis offers. Um, but that doesn't lend itself uh, to the families who, who need the additional support to even become a member of this community. Uh, I think that Corvallis already does a great job um, in some of their low income housing programs um, with assistance for like down payments for home ownership. I think that is a great first step and I think that program could deserve, should deserve some additional attention and support. Um, but I mentioned earlier that uh, building codes and incentivizing uh, building right now is a huge opportunity for the city. Um, because we are able to collect the CET, the construction excise tax, and put that towards these programs uh, that benefit low income housing, um, and at least if nothing else, making opportunities more available uh, to individuals who would not otherwise have the ability to become homeowners uh, in this community. Thank you. Mr. Schaefer? Yeah, I, I made vague reference to this in my initial statement. I think it's just stunning that Corvallis has 20,000 people commuting to town every day, and, and much of that's because they can't afford to live here. Um, we have some of the most expensive housing in the state. Um, I think there's several things that need to be done. I think at the affordable housing end, um, the city has been subsidizing using construction excise tax, uh, development of affordable housing. The city is looking at um, waiving system development charges for affordable housing, which will again help make it cheaper. Um, House Bill 2001, which will um, require cities to allow what's called middle housing, duplexes, triplexes, cottage clusters and the like. Um, in area zone for single family housing will help, but those things are all going to take time. Um, I think it's time for Corvallis to take a hard look at um, growth in the city, annexations. Um, I know it's a dirty word for a lot of people in Corvallis, but I think we have to recognize that we need to grow and we need to have um, land that's able to be developed and we have to have affordable development on some of that land. We'll continue to have high-end houses. We need everything else as well. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Next question, and we'll start with you, Mr. Schaefer. What are your ideas for taking care of the unhoused population in our community? Again, what are your ideas for taking care of the unhoused population in our community? I think we need to recognize that, like when we talked of climate change, this is not just a Corvallis problem. And it's also a long-term problem. It's, it's a problem that's been with us for quite a while. Um, I think I am opposed to what, frankly, the, the city has proposed. I think we will see it changed. It's gonna be a discussion at council at our next meeting, uh, beginning to repost homeless camps. I think if all we're doing is taking the, the most um, at-risk people in our community and all we're doing is hassling them and moving them around when they have no place to go, that's counterproductive. It wastes resources. It doesn't help them. I think we need to find 
locations where we can um, develop additional camps where people can establish permanent, uh, maybe it's tents, maybe it's Conestoga camps, maybe it's micro shelters. Um, we have to do that, but that's, there's a real problem with land availability in Corvallis. The city has recently funded 15 micro shelters. I think we can continue to do that. Um, the city also needs more transitional housing and it needs more shelters. It, it, this, the homeless need help at a variety of levels. Um, we've been able to, to actually fund a fair bit of that with CARES Act money. Um, we need to continue to fund that. And as I said in my initial statement, that is a priority, um, even in times of tight budgets. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Mr. Bowman? Um, echoing those same sentiments, I also believe that um, finding good community stewards uh, to take the charge is how we address this issue. Uh, there's nonprofits all over who help uh, with services that are not just for housing, um, but for career placement um, and job readiness. And those sort of resources are the long-term solutions that move people out of a um, unhoused situation. Um, so doubling down on our relationships with these nonprofits, one such example um, about to open downtown um, is Pathfinder Clubhouse. Um, places like this where we offer services to individuals, um, whether it be mental health services, whether it be career um, services, uh, application services, hygiene services. Uh, these are the things, as I said, that provide somebody with the confidence and the skills to move themselves out of these situations. Um, but we need the good community stewards who are able to be liaisons between that population um, and the community at large. Um, and that community is a part of our community. Um, so let's make sure that we are supporting them through these long lasting um, effective measures. Um, but the city's support thus far in micro dwellings um, has been a step in the right direction and I would continue to support that as well. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Before we go to our next question and Mr. Bowman, you will start us off. We wanted to welcome the new community members that have joined us. Uh, welcome to the space. And we invite everyone, if you have an opportunity to, or you would like to, please feel free to uh, populate your, your, your questions there in the Q&A feature. Again, please feel free to populate your, or ask your questions there in the Q&A feature. All right, Mr. Bowman, what can the city do to balance the rights and desires of neighboring property owners and city or state plans for new development. Again, what can the city do to balance the rights and desires of neighboring property owners and city and state plans for new development? I think the city already does a fair amount of outreach when it comes to um, community input and trying to get as many um, opposing views and or communal views as possible when it comes to any sort of like land usage, uh, development projects. And that right there is a step in the right direction, is at least getting voices heard. Because there's quite often going to be a conflict of interest in many situations. Not to say that it can't be overcame um, because there's also common ground in many of our desires. Um, so finding those common grounds uh, is important, but giving the community members voices so that they are feeling heard is the first step. Um, I know that we have great digital resources for getting community engagement. Um, but I don't think that we're all the way to a population that solely engages electronically. We're fast moving as a collective that direction, um, but there needs to be more boots on the ground in some situations um, so that every voice is heard. Thank you. Mr. Schaefer. Okay, I was afraid you lost your mic there for a moment. <laughs> Um, I think in, in land use and development, um, the city does do a lot of outreach. Um, neighbors are notified when there's a proposal. Um, there are public hearings for everything. Sometimes it's ridiculous. Last night we had a public hearing about annexing one home 
on property into the city because of a failed septic system where the person really had no alternative and, and it was a pro forma exercise. But I think the important thing is there is a process for hearing people, for notifying people. Um, I would note that decisions um, ultimately are based on land development codes. Uh, those are reviewed very carefully by city staff. They're uh, reviewed relative to state law, which has um, preempted a lot of the decisions that used to be made at the city level on annexations and, and certain kinds of housing um, within communities and related to zoning. Um, I, I think the city does, frankly, and the state does a pretty good job of, of bringing people into this. People may not like the decisions, but there is an established and a very public process for doing it. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Our final question, uh, at least from the questions that we received um, prior, and again, we invite folks to populate their questions, and I believe I'll see two, which is great. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Schaefer. Uh, what can the city do to balance the rights? I'm sorry, let's fix that. Sorry. <laughs> what steps can the city and county take to involve communities of color in land use and housing processes and decisions? Again, what can the city and county take, excuse me, what, can, what steps can the city and county take to involve communities of color in land use and housing processes and decisions? Mr. Schaefer. Um, I think first of all, as I said a moment ago, there are notifications, there are processes. Um, there is a public process and everybody is invited to participate. However, I think that begs the question um, for those who are in one way or another disenfranchised, out of the loop, um, not savvy, not able to afford um, modern, you know, web links, lawyers, whatever it takes to be involved. Um, frankly, I think the city probably has not explicitly reached out in a lot of cases and in a lot of ways. I think recognizing that there's a problem is the first step. And I think just as the economic development people have made it a priority to go to minority communities in, in funding during the COVID epidemic, I think it's incumbent on other agencies of the city and county to recognize uh, minority populations and to make a special effort to reach out that they're aware and to encourage them to participate. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Mr. Bowman. The cognizant approach to including um, voices of color w in any decision going forward um, is something that should be at the forefront of thought process. Uh, we are at a time in our history when real change is being made, but not without, as I said, the cognizant approach of doing so. Um, we have to identify places of opportunity where voices of color are not being served and not being represented. And if that is in land use, if that is in public policy, is if that is participation in any way, shape or form, um, then that needs to be immediately identified and sought to rectify. Um, I am of the mindset that there are experts um, who can get connected. There are community li liaisons who can be empowered um, to be a larger voice for their community um, and bringing those individuals on board to make connections. Um, closing those gaps of access um, is a place where we should begin. Thank you. Thank you both. 
Um, now we're going to transition to some questions that are that are being being asked by some of our uh, community members that are viewing. Again, thank you so much, community members, for hanging hanging in there with us. Uh, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Bowman. Uh, thinking about long-term solutions for our unhoused neighbors and our city working collectively to address it, what do you see Ward 7 contributing in terms of space and resources? Again, thinking about the long-term solutions of our unhoused neighbors, and our city working collect collectively to address that issue. What do you see within Ward 7 as ways to contribute uh, to the space, uh, to the terms of space and resources? I, I think that this is a mixed use land development sort of question. Um, <clears throat> Ward 7 does not have a lot of um, area that is not residential. Um, it is like straight residential corner to corner pretty much. Um, and taking advantage of what housing is available, um, allocating it as possibly transitional housing, um, working in conjunction once again with nonprofit agencies or other governmental agencies that allows us to um, serve and service and implant these um, individuals into these safe transitional spaces um, is the best I think that Ward 7 could do. Um, there's not a large um, like community center in here. We do have, I'm trying to think, I think two churches, trying to, um, but it's, it, there's not a lot of large spaces. It is mostly residential and like two stores. Um, so finding space that is not residential um, and allocating it in some sort of way would be difficult. So as I said, I think transitional housing in some sort would be Ward 7's contribution to um, this issue. Thank you. Mr. Schaefer? Yeah, I would, I would agree with Nick that undeveloped property is at a uh, minimum in Ward 7. And on top of that, in many cities, parklands are used as uh, for setting up camps for the homeless as, a, as an interim step. Um, in Corvallis, that unfortunately is precluded by city charter. Um, it takes a vote of the public to use a park for any purpose other than as a park. And so that's a challenge. I think we have a few churches. I think we could be encouraging them, um, again, as, as Mr. Bowman suggested, they could be hosting camps, they could be hosting micro shelters um, or other sorts of, of interim housing solutions. And there is, there is a minimal amount of space um, in a few places where we could develop um, or modify existing housing to use it for transitional housing. There is some of that being done um, in some of the other locations in Corvallis, and there are some larger buildings that could be used um, as at, redeveloped to, to provide some transitional housing. Um, so it's not easy, but there are some options. Thank you. Uh, our next question from one of our community members. Uh, we'll start with you, Mr. Schaefer. How will you engage more residents of Ward 7 to better understand diverse needs? How will you engage more residents of Ward 7 to better understand diverse needs? That's a, that's a kind of a painful question for me because when I ran a year ago, I walked the whole ward um, and anywhere I encountered people, I, I stopped to talk. Um, I had a lot of plans for public outreach. Um, I had plans to go walk the street in the ward to have public, you know, host public meetings, those sorts of things. COVID has pretty much blown up all of those ideas for the time being. Um, Outreach is a challenge. Um, I've, I've worked diligently for the past year. I've put together an email distribution list of a, about 250 people that I communicate with regularly. Um, I'm, I'm not a um, what am I trying to say? Uh, Facebook kind of person. So that's not where I'm going to go. I would also note that in, in 
Corvallis government, anytime anybody wants to contact me as their counselor, I've encouraged them to do so to the extent I can. They can go to the city website and find my name, my email, my phone number, and I encourage them to contact me. Um, some people do often. The majority of people in the ward I've never heard from. And it's, it's a challenge to, to reach out to those people. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Mr. Bowman? Um, I would say that COVID-19 has definitely presented itself some challenges. Um, and I had a couple of weeks where I wasn't able to go pound the pavement because of uh, the fire. Um, but I'm still getting myself out there. And I think that that needs to continue to be the process. Um, there's a lot of individuals within our ward who are perfectly fine with getting online and looking up information for their local government and reaching out that way. I think we have a very large population here too who does not engage that way. Um, and to say that every city councilor needs to go and walk their ward um, and go door to door is a big ask. Um, but this is why we need to have a larger team um, out there collecting information, getting out there and seeing the people face to face I have spent many miles um, on these streets over the last month or so. And while I'm not knocking on anybody's doors, I'm still talking to people in their driveways. Um, I am catching them doing yard work, um, walk, talking on the sidewalk and engaging that way. Um, and there are still ways to connect. Um, there are still ways to connect. And that's the way that you get out there and see them. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Boatman, uh, our next question. <clears throat> How will you increase a sense of community within the wards and residents? Uh oh, sorry. Uh, that was my timer. timer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How will you How will you increase a sense of community within the ward and residents' own participation in the city processes? Again, how will you increase a sense of community? within the ward and residents on, to own participation in the city processes? Right now, um, creating a sense of community is something that is difficult to do um, because community is that feeling that you're a part of something bigger. And if you're not able to you know, go to the park and hang out with 30 of your closest friends celebrating the same common interests, um, go gather in a field with a bunch of people to watch the solar eclipse a few years ago. Like there, there are events that bring people together to make them feel a part of a community. Um, but the situation that we're in right now, I think goes back to my answer to the last question. Uh, you have to get out there and you have to connect with people so that they at least know that their voice is heard and constantly remind them that they are a part of something bigger um, and find a way to connect their shared values with the community's overall visions and goals. Um, if you're able to do such, you start to inch your way into that sense of community. I teach online right now to a bunch of sixth graders who I have never met face to face. Um, and this might be the first year where I'm struggling so hard to create the sense of community. Um, but reaching out with, to each one of them as an individual has brought them into the fold slowly but surely. And I'm hoping that before the year's end, they have what has been in the years past a true sense of community. And I hope to do that with the people here in Ward 7 as well. Thank you. Mr. Schaefer? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. Um, we are in the process. I was on a committee looking at restructuring advisory boards because uh, they kind of take up all the oxygen for public participation for a lot of people. And so we want to redo that and look for other ways to get public participation. I would note there have been a couple of online um, meetings. There was one for Circle Boulevard back in the spring that was very well attended, much better than, than an in-person meeting probably would have been. Um, having to go next to the next room and, and turn on your computer is a whole lot less work than going to the library or someplace for a public meeting. Um, neighborhood associations, build a sense of community. We don't have enough of them in Ward 7. That was one of the things I had hoped to um, work with to expand, but the reality is with COVID, the timing is, is not right 
for that, for those kinds of, of interactions in groups. And I think as, as uh, Mr. Bowman suggested, you know, one-on-ones, um, a lot of one-on-ones. I send out a newsletter to a couple hundred people also. Um, I have coffees with individuals. And, and, and one of the things I try to do is always ask for feedback, ask people to share information, um, to, to just keep trying to reach out. I think historically Ward 7 is a fairly mellow place and the, the involvement probably isn't as high as it is in a lot of other neighborhoods because we tend not to have those burning issues that get people excited and organized. And that's a, that cuts both ways. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, our next question, we'll start with you, Mr. Schaefer. To address climate change and to make Corvallis a safer, more livable community, what do you think the city should do to get more people out of their single occupancy vehicles and use active transportation, such as walking, biking, or riding transit? Again, to address to address climate change and to make Corvallis a safer, more livable community, what do you think the city should do to get more people out of their single occupancy vehicles and use active transportation, such as walking, biking, or routing transit? There's some things the city is already doing. Um, I, I would note that the reconfiguration of Circle Boulevard was done with that as a one of the primary motivations to make it safer for, for, for bikers and pedestrians. Um, the, uh, the city has been developing and developing signage for bikeways um, and, and, and streets that are safer for bikes. The city is looking at something called Vision Zero. Um, which is a, an effort to literally reduce traffic accidents and, and injuries to zero. Uh, I think the city bus service is free. They've altered routes in the past year to try to make it more accessible to more people. Um, and I think that's COVID has kind of knocked that back for a while, but it's, it, it's a service that is available and encourages. I think one of the biggest problems with Corvallis, as I noted earlier, we have 20,000 commuters who drive to town every day, every work day. Most of them come in single vehicles. Um, and it, I think the city and particularly Oregon State need to look at, um, you can look at it as incentivizing carpooling or disincentivizing single occupant vehicles. Uh, but I think that's a direction we need to go in, as well as looking at uh, better carpools, van pools, and the like. Thank you. Mr. Bowman? I think that the citizens of Corvallis, in large, at large, really do appreciate, which is why this is coming up right now, um, natural forms of transportation um, outside of the car world. Um, but to create a change, I think in this large of a issue, it almost needs to be a, a forcible change. Not saying that taxes are the way to do everything, and uh, I, I, I state this very cautiously, but maybe something like a mileage tax. Um, other cities have like emissions taxes and things like that, road taxes. Um, that are odometer reading based or otherwise um, tracked so that the miles put on our roads um, have an additional about accountability um, but that in turn also impacts you know other environmental things as well too in a positive way. Um, so I think that that is a potential avenue um, without having more information on that. Um, I wouldn't put that out there all the way <laughs> but I, I think that people want the change, um, but they need a, a hard incentive um, to to make them make that leap for those few who are reluctant. Um, I'm a commuter and I commute in a single vehicle to Lebanon back and forth. Um, and carpooling right now, yes, is a challenge and there are individuals in my building who I could share this with, um, but I get to work, you know, different problem. Um, 
but providing citizens with a sort of forcible change here um, might be the only way to really um, make this happen. But, you know, the city does a great job putting on events like we just had the no car day. Uh, I think that was like on the 21st or 22nd of this last month. So mm -hmm. more things like that too. Thank you so much. Ms. Schaefer? I already answered. You started. That's right. I started. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying to, I'm reading a lot of different things over here. Okay, no problem. Okay, uh, just... so Mr. Schaefer, uh, we'll, we'll uh, turn it to you for uh, uh, closing remarks. Uh, and so we'll provide um, uh, two minutes for you to provide closing statements. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, in closing, um, thank you for, for moderating this, Jason, and thank you to the league, and thank you for the, to the audience for, for joining us. Um, it's, it's been a challenge, an interesting ride, an honor, whatever, you can call it a lot of things, but I appreciate um, the chance to serve for the past year. I appreciate the confidence that people placed in me by voting for me. Um, I, I would hope I can win your support again this year, but regardless of who you vote for, I would say, please vote. It's, it's exceedingly important this year, probably more than ever in my lifetime. Um, as I said at the start, um, I'm, I'm running partly because I want to give back to the community. I think it's important that we do that. Um, I, I noted that I have the experience and qualifications to be a good counselor. Um, and, and I've added to that experience by serving on council for the last year. It's given me a chance to, to know and work with the city, the staff, the programs of the city. And it's a, it's a steep learning curve. It's a big learning curve. And I want to put that to use. Um, Corvallis is a, is a good and well-managed city. Whoever's elected, we need to keep it that way. It's been a very strange year um, in Corvallis with COVID. Um, it, it, as I noted, didn't give me the chance to do some of the things I wanted to do as a counselor in terms of communicating with, with citizens of the ward. Um, but we all went through that. We're all getting through it. We're all figuring it out. And in some ways, I think we're better for it. Um, we're going to be managing in a time of, of tight budgets and program cuts. And I've done that. I don't like it. Nobody likes it. Um, but I think I have the, the skills. I have an appreciation of what's what in Corvallis government that will make it easier and more effective for me to help make those decisions about what to do with city government. Um, I think I want to just close in a, in a sense by noting, um, we've talked about communicating tonight. Anybody, anytime, if you have questions for me as your city councilor, go to the city website. Um, my contact information's there. I encourage you to use it. I will respond. Um, I think that's enough said. You're right at it. Thank you so much, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, Mr. Bowman. Uh, I too would like to thank uh, League of Women Voters as well as NAACP for bringing this evening uh, for the public. Um, it's events like this um, that are at the heart of my um, desire to be your city councilor. When I entered this race, it wasn't because I was upset with the current status quo. Um, it was because I saw an opportunity to participate. Um, I am somebody who is also able to give of my experience, my time, and my resources back to the city. I love Corvallis, and I love public service. I think that there are many qualifications that I too could bring to this job that would serve my city, my fellow citizens, my community very well. I know what it takes to make tough decisions in the face of adversity. I know what it takes to bring communities who are at odds together. Parties who disagree with one another can be recollected and resolved. And I wanna be that in between for the community and for the city of Corvallis as a governmental agency. 
I have no political aspirations beyond this seat. I don't know what my future holds for me, but I know that Corvallis is a part of it. And I'd like this opportunity for nothing else than to give back with the time that I have. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Mr. Bowman. Thank you both, uh, Mr. Mr. Nick Bowman and Mr. Paul Schaefer, Schaefer for your um, time today. And thank you also to the residents and community members of, of Ward 7. Before we close, I would like to share a few announcements. Um, please come back uh, next week on Wednesday, October the 14th uh, at 7 p.m. for our County Commissioner's Forum. Again, save the date, Wednesday, October the 14th at 7 p.m. for our County Commissioner's Forum. We would also invite you to visit the League of Women Voters Facebook page as well as their website in the case that you uh, had not, have not received the, um, the link or the, or the credentials to join that meeting. Also, we encourage you to uh, visit our NAACP Facebook page uh, as well as our website in the case that you wish to get more involved with either one of those groups. We would also like to thank again our uh, candidates for spending the evening with us. We would love to like to thank um, everyone behind the scenes who've been helping us uh, uh, operate uh, this entire uh, uh, program. And we also would want to appreciate the League of Women Voters and the local chapter of the NAACP for partnering to move or to bring forth such uh, uh, an important forum tonight. I think that's all of our time. Thank you all so much. Um, again, this recording will be posted on our website. So in the case that you have friends or neighbors who were not able to view this tonight, uh, this entire session will be posted on the League of Women uh, Voters uh, website. Okay. All right. Well, uh, again, uh, thank you all so much. Uh, stay safe. Wear your mask. Please, everyone, vote. Vote, vote, vote. Oh. Thank you all again so much, and have a great evening. Thank you, Jason. Thank you all. Thank you, Nick. Well.